Coming up on What Women Want to Know. This one woman I spoke to, she was really morbidly obese. And I said, is it all right to talk about your weight? And then she opened up that she started putting on weight. She was great when she was 21. And she was crying and saying to me, I think I wanted to make myself disgusting so no one would ever do that again. I'm your host, Dr. Adana, and this is What Women Want to Know. The show where we navigate the complex, fascinating, and sometimes intimidating world of women's health and well-being. Here, we create a safe, judgment-free space where no topics are off limits. We confront our fears, we embrace our vulnerabilities, and we find humor in the unexpected. Welcome to What Women Want to Know. Before we get into today's conversation, I want to personally invite you to join our community. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button and turn on the notification so that you're aware when a new episode goes live, which is every Sunday at 6 p.m. GMT. If you're listening on Spotify or any other platform for that matter, hit that follow button and leave us a review. It helps us grow as a community and ultimately reach more women who need to be part of the conversation. The media and society have played a significant role in how women view themselves. We're surrounded by constant noise of how we should look. Skinny, curvy, and every other thing that's used to describe what sexy or beautiful should look like. And with health information running rampant online, women especially are often confused about what constitutes a healthy lifestyle. On the show today, we are cutting through that noise with practical advice. Join us as we explore how making informed choices about our diet and daily habits can significantly impact our overall health and happiness. We'll explore the transformative power of integrating nutrition and lifestyle choices into our daily routines and how these decisions can profoundly impact our overall well-being. I'm excited to introduce our special guest today, Dr. Sophie Newton. She's a GP in the UK and a dedicated advocate for nutrition and lifestyle medicine. Dr. Newton's expertise extends beyond the clinic. She's a YouTube health creator and was a regular resident GP on Channel 4's Steps Packed Lunch. Her passion for empowering individuals with practical, evidence-based health advice and her experience as a mother of three makes her very relatable and equipped to address this topic. What women want to know. Welcome to the show, Dr. Newton. It's so great to have you here. Thank you very much for having me. I'm very excited. Good. We're going to jump right into it. I have let the audience know your amazing profile and all of the cool things that you're doing in this space. Why don't you start off by sharing what inspired you to focus on nutrition and lifestyle medicine? Sure. I am a GP. So I did years of GP training, actually, because I kept having babies and working part time. And so I worked in lots of different GP practices. And even though the guidance for so many long term conditions is lifestyle first, I kind of noticed that most GPs just weren't doing that they were kind of jumping to almost the easier option which is just writing a prescription and like focusing on let's have a look at the underlying causes of these chronic long-term conditions so I kind of got a bit disillusioned that this was being a bit lost and then I found out that there is a speciality called lifestyle medicine and I was so excited and then I found people who were also doing it doctors who were doing it and I was like I found my tribe this is it I mean did that inspiration come from a personal experience of you trying to live a more like healthier lifestyle well I guess I as an adult, I've always been kind of healthy vaguely. I still am healthy vaguely, which I think actually is overall healthy. <laughs> and then I kind of was dealing with patients and realizing that so much more could be managed if you get to kind of the nub of the problem. So it's not just a case of saying to people, oh, you know, your knee arthritis has improved, you lose weight, because we know that actually doesn't work. It's about actually learning how do we manage these issues? You know, there's weight loss, so you should sleep more. And people know the stuff, but how do you do that? And I was kind of fed up of hearing like influencers and stuff who are like, guys, have an avocado smoothie, start your day with this. And <laughs> it's great if that's how you roll, but like a lot of my patients, you know, they can't even afford avocados. I wanted to help 
people achieve realistic lifestyle changes. Oh, that's nice. What is nutrition and lifestyle medicine? So there is different societies of lifestyle medicine, the American society of lifestyle medicine, British society of lifestyle medicine, and it, it relies on six pillars. So it's about mm. improving nutrition, improving activity levels, improving sleep, improving mental well-being, reducing harmful substances, which kind of, when I first started, was mostly kind of like smoking and excess alcohol and recreational drugs, but now actually includes gambling and excess internet use and excess social media. Oh, that's an interesting one. Yeah, it's kind of interesting that that has now been consumed into that. And also improving healthy relationships. You know, that's often overlooked. We know that kind of loneliness, they say, is as dangerous as smoking now. So it's looking at the whole of the person and thinking about how can we improve their healthy lifestyle in so many different ways. It's interesting that you've mentioned social media as one of the pillars of harmful substance. Yeah. which I think is a great bridge to my next question, which is how do you think social media influences people's perception of health and nutrition? I think there's so much good out there, but I think there's probably more false information. There's a lot of people who are not qualified to be giving information who do and who have huge followings and people assume because they look good. You know, they have like, they're slim, maybe they're muscular, but they work out. So people can't think they must know what they're talking about. That must be real. I worry that it's fear mongering. So people become afraid of certain things. Like you must not eat sugar. Sugar is the demon. Da, 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 da. I don't think people should be afraid of any food. There's a lot of camps of like, you must eat keto or you must be carnivore. Yeah, I mean, all the diet culture. You don't have to be any one of these. Like studies show, for example, for weight loss, we know the most uh, efficient diet is the one that that individual will enjoy, can afford, and will stick to. Mm -hmm. And also I worry about the guilt because not many of us look like the people that we're all scrolling through. Yeah, but genes even play a factor that people don't mention, right? I mean, your genetics do play a factor to how your body's built, whether you're a bit taller, you have a bit more muscle, you're skinnier. And obviously that is the danger that you just glorify someone that you see, you asp aspire to look like them and think that you have to do everything that they're doing to look like them. Like we all have the same 24 hours in the day. So if I look like this, you can look like this. And it's like, they have no awareness of their own privilege. You know, they have the time and money and, you know, the resources to be able to spend all the time doing this. But often there's a lot of negativity online and I think people have to start to be aware. If it's inspiring them and it's making them think, great, tomorrow I'm gonna, you know, do X, Y, Z, then great. So I think it's just trying to bring an awareness into realizing how it's making you feel. What are your tips for finding reliable sources then? Social media isn't going away. The data is there. Lots and lots of people are going to social media first to find information. They're all going to Google and social media before they even turn up to their GPs or before they even turn to an expert to ask for advice. Now that we know that that's the way it's done, I think people then need to be aware of how to find reliable sources. And do you have any tips for that? So um, I have a YouTube channel and YouTube have recently started a thing called YouTube Health. And so the stamp underneath videos like mine that say from a registered health professional. Yeah, so I would say kind of have a look. What are the qualifications of the person who you're listening to? It is tricky because even like nutritionist is a woolly term and doesn't actually mean they've got any kind of real grounding in nutrition. So a dietitian in this country is, is the term registered dietitian. But I'd also say watch out if they're giving you that kind of extreme advice, then I would be skeptical. From what you're saying, your approach is every individual is unique. It's never one size fits all. A hundred percent. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. As a GP, how do you incorporate this sort of advice into your practice then? Well, I was finding it so difficult because we have 10 minutes. Yeah, there's a data that on average GPs get 9.5 minutes to have a consult. So you're under that pressure of trying to diagnose, trying to prescribe and trying to give lifestyle advice. So how do you navigate that? Well, that is what inspired me to start making my videos because I thought they can watch it in their own time. And so I started my YouTube channel at firstly just about lifestyle medicine. So my first videos were kind of things like meditation, is it worth it? How could you try it? Improving sleep, that kind of thing. And then that kind of progressed into conditions that I see all the time. My videos started because I just don't have time to do a good enough job and I didn't want to like fail my patients. I'm sorry, I haven't really got time today, but try and be healthy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I suppose that highlights the advantage of social media then, right? Because we 
often focus on the negatives and everyone talks about the dangers of social media. But then when you have qualified healthcare professionals like yourself, who is also a YouTube health creator, leveraging the platform to share reliable evidence-based information that you wish your patient had, but you don't have time to share with them in the clinic, that really highlights one of the advantages of social media. Yeah, definitely. And I think there is a bit of a change, you know, the fact that YouTube kind of taking it seriously. I've just joined the World Health Organization and started up, have I've got a group of 100 medics at the moment who are helping with promoting good medical information online, which is exciting. But yeah, I think more and more people, companies as well, are realizing they have to take responsibility for the information that they're helping to spread and to make sure that we've got more reliable health information. What women want to know. The topic of nutrition and diet and lifestyle is a big topic because of the dangers when it goes wrong. We talked about people idolizing people that they look up to on social media, wanting to look like them, wanting to be like them. We talk about society and culture that has historically policed women's bodies and how they should look. You know, skinny is sexy, curvy is sexy. There's all these trends and women are constantly under the pressure of how to look. Do you have any experience where you've seen young women or even women in general that walk into your practice and you feel like, hey, I do need to address the topic about their lifestyle and their nutrition. Maybe they look like there is an underlying eating disorder. How do you bring up those difficult conversations without stepping over the boundaries or without body shaming? Yeah, I, that's a really good question and something that I think as a healthcare professional, more people need to understand how to have to start those conversations. There's the fine balance between we don't want to body shame, but we don't want to ignore the fact this may be having a, a detrimental effect on their health. And I see obviously both ends of the spectrum, people who are possibly have an eating disorder and are underweight and malnourished and people who are having sometimes eating disorder, but obviously struggling with kind of being in bigger bodies that might be negatively impacting their weight. So I often say things like, oh, I can see some blood results that some of these liver tests are off. And sometimes that's caused by, if you're carrying a bit of extra weight, that can affect the liver itself. Would you be happy mm. today to talk to you about your weight? And if they say no, I'm going to leave it because they're not in a place ready to talk about it. They know, everybody know, you know, nobody's like, what? If they want to talk about it, they're ready to listen. And often at least I've laid the seed and they could come back another time and say, you mentioned about my weight and I think actually I do want to talk. I think that's a really important way the language we use because some people are happy to use the word fat I don't like the word fat but some people are trying to reclaim it as a positive term so it's about like people in bigger bodies that's usually a better kind of terminology I do appreciate that you shed light on the other aspect of maybe eating disorders because when we mention that and when we talk about the disorders we tend to highlight more anorexia and bulimia but really there is that trickiness or the discomfort in talking to somebody who you can see is overweight how do you approach that conversation without again body shaming in your experience have you had patients who you've laid the seed about the conversation surrounding their weight and then they come back to you it's actually really Really rewarding because often they're kind of like no one has ever been kind about this and people are not kind mm. to themselves there's so much emotion tied up but especially when people are kind of like when they're really big and it really is affecting their health they're not happy nobody chooses to be like that we know now obesity is a chronic disease and it, we should treat it as we do things like high blood pressure and type 2 diabetes and i've had so many really emotional conversations like this one woman i spoke to she was really morbidly obese loads of health problems really struggling with her mobility because all the joints were under so much strain it's had lots of so many medications because of all these problems it was related to and I said is it all right to talk about your weight and and then we kind of got into a discussion about it and she could sense that I was you know open to, to discussion and kind of being kind about it and then she opened up that she started putting on weight she was great when she was 21 and she was crying and saying to me I think I wanted to make myself disgusting so no one would ever do that again the trauma of it mm. there's like I hate myself now I'm disgusting and I mean that's obviously an extreme case but mm. these pressures that you talk about every woman has got issues with their body you know like we've been forced upon us and that's why I think the most important thing is be kind to yourself and it's certainly isn't just a case of you know you just have got poor willpower so i think what i'm hearing is most of the time 
where, when there is a problem with the weight, whether it's being overweight or being very underweight, when there is like an eating disorder, it's deeper than that. It's deeper than the physical. There's something emotional underlying that we owe to our patients to uncover. Well, it certainly often is. I guess it doesn't mean that always is because what we also know is that, especially kind of yo-yo dieting when people are kind of crash dieting, putting weight on, taking it off, that it totally affects your, your hormones and your metabolism. So once people have kind of got into that cycle, your body wants to hold on to that weight. So in your experience, what are some of the common challenges that people face when they're trying to improve their diet and their lifestyle then? Well, dieting itself, because obviously people think, I want to lose weight, I will go on a diet. And they will calorie restrict for however long and they will lose weight. And then they go back to their normal eating and then the weight is going to go back on. So I would say to someone, unless this is a thing you're going to do forever, then it's not going to work. And it has to be things that you can create a habit for, things that you almost don't even think about. What's your take on a healthy strategy to lose weight for people who choose to? And I say this very loosely because losing weight, just if you look at that term in itself without any context, that is where lots of women feel the pressure. We feel the need to lose weight because being skinny is the trend. But when we put it in context to maybe somebody who is obese, somebody who has openly had a conversation with their GP or their doctor, and they both agree that they need to lose weight to be healthier, not to be skinny. What is the, the strategy then to remain consistent? Well, it's certainly, I think acknowledging it's not easy. You know, this is the one thing that will burn your belly fat. You know, that's what everybody wants. I mean, there are medications now, which are great actually. And I think we will be using more and more of are you talking for patients who are obese or are we talking about the trend that everyone is jumping on Ozempic? Yeah, well, there's Ozempic. I know, but there is a trend of women who don't need the medication jumping on it so that they can lose weight and be skinny. I mean, that is dangerous. Yeah, so in, for the NHS, you've got to have a BMI of over 30. Okay, so it is regulated then. Yeah, but you can buy it privately and I guess it's up to the private prescriber so obviously yeah people who just want a better body and it shouldn't be for them because that like any medication there are significant side effects certainly lots of people get gi side effects like gut problems but even increased risk of thyroid cancer and stuff like that so i would not take it lightly but yeah so i think that's why i did a 10-step plan because i couldn't squeeze everything into one video because there's so much to talk about you know my first one is about eat more because actually most people aren't having enough fiber and protein like again when they're dieting they're miserable they're thinking about food all the time so instead of trying to think about what you have to avoid, think about what you can increase more of. Also, one of my videos is called Lose Weight Without Trying, because actually what you don't want to do is focus on the weight loss. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I've not been caught by the diet trend bug. I mean, I've gone through my early 20s where it was the thing. Like, even whilst I was in med school, you'd hear people say, oh, I'm on a keto diet, I'm on a this diet, all these trends. And I'm curious. I'm like, oh, I'm going to try this. And a lot of the diets, like you said, involves restricting what that does to me is i could go through that week or two weeks of saying hey i'm restricting myself from eating xyz but when the two weeks done my brain literally just kicks in to say we're gonna go back to those things we missed and we're gonna eat all of it at once and it's this yo-yo thing that really doesn't work for anyone i mean i've calorie counted i had apps where i would chew gum and put the calorie of the gum that I've chewed in there. I can look back and, and say to myself, I don't think I had an eating disorder. But now, I mean, what is that then? It is craziness. It is a disorder then. I did it as a teenager. I became obsessed and would kind of, yeah, drain the milk from my cereal. I didn't want any, any I was worried about the fat and that. And then just everything, counting the calories of everything. That was because at the time I was modeling. That's another industry that really puts a lot of pressure on women. Perhaps my, that experience is what has led me on to kind of really want people to think about being healthy versus being thin. I mean, I was pretty thin, but they wanted me to be skinny. Because I said to them, I've been going to the gym five times a week, I'm eating so, I'm like really trying hard to calorie count, da da da. And they said to me, well, skip breakfast, have a coffee and a fag at lunchtime, and then just eat something in the evening. I was like, I don't smoke, I don't even like coffee. I'm not, what? <laughs> Oh, that is crazy. I suppose you were in an industry that influenced you to do that. I was never in an industry that influenced me to do that. My biggest influence, honestly, were the people around me. The friends who were so deep into the way that they looked. I'm grateful that I grew up as a confident young woman. 
And I never felt body shamed. I never felt ashamed of my body ever. To this day, I've never looked at myself in the mirror to say, hey, you're so fat or you're so skinny. You need to do this. You need to do that. I've never talked to myself negatively, but I have been influenced by the people around me who are doing things that they have convinced me was a healthy thing to do. And I thought, well, I'm going to jump on the trend. And I had a close friend at uni who, again, would have a black tea without any milk, would have an apple for lunch, would pick on something like salad leaves, you know, at night time. I mean, when I tried to do that, I was so, so bloody hungry. I was like, um, this is not sustainable. I'm eating my food. And so quickly that influence was out the window. I'm like, I, I love my food far too much. But the thing is, I've caught up with her now as a mom. She's a mom to three young girls. And we've had this honest conversation where she said, I look back and I realized that I had an eating disorder that I didn't even admit to myself. It took me having three daughters to get out of this craziness because this is not what I want to teach my children. And you're a mom as well. You have two girls and you have a boy. How has motherhood influenced your approach to eating healthy, to nutrition, to diet, to lifestyle? Well, I thought I was going to nail it. <laughs> My kids are going to eat really well. They are not going to be fussy. And, you know, even when I was pregnant, I was like, right, I'm going to eat such a varied diet. And then when I was breastfeeding, I was like, right, I'm going to eat spices. I'm going to eat this. I'm going to eat that because I want her to have these days. And basically, I think they all want typical kids' foods. They don't love vegetables. That's honest. <laughs> And also because they know that I am interested in health and nutrition, but they're kind of like, oh, mom. So much so that I kind of realized I had to take a step back because I didn't want chocolate and things to be like a super treat that they were so excited about that they never had mm. at home because it's such a balance. But also I have always been so careful never to say anything about my own body in front of them you know just to try not to ever mention it like body positivity or body neutrality you know when they were little sometimes they'd be like oh mom look at that person over there they're cute you know and, like, and I would say that's very interesting you yeah. said that because you know it's none of our business kids are so honest right they just say it <laughs> It's not right for us to talk about anybody else's shape. My daughter, eldest, when she was 12, was like, mummy, I've got a tummy, I'm fat, I've got a tummy, no one else in my ballet class has got a tummy. And I was like, oh, I thought I got this. <laughs> and it's like you said though, I'm not her only source of information. How do you approach that? Because I mean, that's one of my biggest nightmares, you know, amongst a thousand other things that mothers worry about. It's really just the, the body positivity and being conscious about your body and what they're being told in school so how did you approach that conversation well I tried to explain uh, but the thing is and we went in about how everybody's got different shapes you know some people have bigger this bigger that and that doesn't mean you're healthy or unhealthy and even someone who's slim who looks thin might be unhealthy and someone who looks bigger might be healthy like your shape only tells you a limited amount about the person but you only need to worry about you and I said so just don't worry about your shape and then I was like I was trying to find a balance between kind of being like, well, let's make sure you, do, you know, you're just eating healthily. And she was like, oh, do you mean I am fat? And I was like, oh my gosh, no. <laughs> and then I realized that Gulso doesn't really want to listen to me. She just thinks she knows what I'm going to say, which is, doesn't matter, but you're beautiful. She's like, oh, you would say that. Yeah, but it's good that you would say that though. That's really the foundation that we can lay and hope for the best because we're not the, the only source of influence. But the foundation is important. I have also read that you shouldn't tell your girls, your daughters, that they are beautiful because you shouldn't use that as a as a point of reference for them to build an identity on. Hmm, maybe I would challenge that. Personally, I mean, I haven't read that and I tell my daughter she's beautiful the same way I tell my sons that they're beautiful because everyone is beautiful. So, I mean, if I don't praise her, what am I what am I supposed to yeah, do? Yeah, and I think if that's all you complimented I, was their beauty. Sometimes you can't help it as a mom. For me, when I talk about their beauty, it's really not their physical beauty. I don't mean that in the context of look how gorgeous you are, look at the size of your lips and the lashes on your eyes. Just you are a beautiful human being and you're kind and you're brave and you're confident. I do these affirmations with my children. So I might disagree with that. <laughs> 
<laughs> with that piece of article. That sounds really nice. It, it yeah. actually gives the affirmations. I go through all of these affirmations and I, and I say to them, you can do anything. And listen, parenting, there's no manual, right? We, we are hoping that we are doing the best because there are conflicting school of thoughts here. Because if you say to them, you're brave and you're confident, you can do anything. I have read that you might also be taking away the opportunity for them to accept that weakness has a phase or has a place as well that you don't always have to be strong i think that's absolutely true yeah. it's, it's about the balance and, and us hoping that we are doing the best for our children yes yeah, so i've got two girls in a boat but my two girls are so different yeah yeah my sons as well such different personalities and their affirmations i find that it's it's not the same it depends on how one is feeling in what situation i'm i'm in we're just hoping for the best so <laughs> we really are what women want to know. We're taking a break to bring you what women want to share. Zita from Tanzania said, I was born in Tanzania and periods are a big deal to some of the tribes. For example, the Luguru tribe from Morogoro. The women have an Onyango party, I hope I pronounced that well, where she's taught everything about her period, her calendar, pregnancy, and everything about womanhood. During the ceremony, gifts are given to the girl and she gets carried around the village. It's a bit embarrassing because it's now public news and everyone in the village knows that you've started your period. Zita, thank you so much for sharing that. I have now left something new about the tribe in Tanzania. For our listeners and our viewers, do you have something about your tribe that you'd like to share? Maybe something specific to womanhood that's still practiced in your tribe or in your country. Please leave a comment below if you're watching on YouTube. And if you're listening on Spotify or Apple, then head over to our YouTube channel and leave a comment. What would you like for me to read out to our listeners on next week's episode? What women want to know. Speaking about children and laying this foundation where they feel confident, brave, beautiful, but also kind and also accepting of everyone else. Like you saying to your daughter, people have different body shapes and sizes and that doesn't tell you about the person. How important is it to lay these foundations in their school? as well because we're, we're relying on what we're teaching them at home but on the topic of lifestyle nutrition and living healthy how do you think schools can incorporate that very early so that they're not influenced entirely by social media or do you think that that's just a very tricky thing to do yeah it is very difficult i'm chair of government at my kids primary school so quite involved but i do think it's hard i do think there's a lot more room for improvement because they learn about internet safety as well but they don't learn about the influence a friend of mine is a teacher who's kind of stepped away because she's trying to help think about how we can improve lots about this from a side point of view. She says, for example, you know, they learn about biology. They learn about the lungs and the heart and the kidneys, but they don't learn about mental health. She said they had the CAMS come in the community at the Adolescent Mental Health Service. She said, but then they kind of told them all about anxiety and depression and they came away thinking, have I got anxiety? Rather than understanding, it's normal to feel anxious. Talk to children how it is normal to have these different emotions and to help them to acknowledge how they feel like that and what can they do about it. We teach them about biology, but we don't teach them about the mental well-being. And so that yeah. is something I would like to see more of. That's also something that you could influence, you know, now that you're heavily involved in your children's school. In your opinion, I wonder whether this change is really going to come from a national level where we make it a policy that these sort of things are taught to schools or whether the change really starts from where you are, like you being involved in your kids' school, having a parent-teachers meeting where you suggest, hey, this is my experience online. These are the things that I would want you to incorporate in the school. What's your take on that? I think everything I'm talking about realistically to make any significant change needs to be from a societal point of view. The way to tackle obesity isn't for a few people to watch my videos. There has to be a, a shift in the way we think about 
these things that has to come from top down. It has to be about, for example, you know, subsidizing fruit and veg rather than just the sugar tax. But even the people who can afford it, just a much more top down blanket information. And I guess part of lifestyle medicine as well is trying to help somehow build awareness of that, which is a big ask. Yeah, it is a big ask. But we appreciate GPs like yourself who are going beyond the four walls of your practice to say, hey, here's another outlet. I'm going to make that one video, even if it positively influences only one person, right? It's really about starting where we are but advocating for change on a higher level. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of guilt about people feeling that everything, the pressure's all on them. And although people should take individual responsibility, there needs to be collective responsibility as well. And you're also a big advocate for the simplicity when it comes to implementing a healthier lifestyle and physical activity. So what tips can you give to adult individuals who are so busy with work and with life, but would want to start a healthy lifestyle? in a way that they can maintain it because I've I've personally fallen into the pressure of thinking that for me to stay physically active, I have to be registered to a gym. That takes monthly fees. That also takes the commitment of going to the gym. And then I fall into this cycle of, oh, I haven't been to the gym this many times and I'm paying this, or I haven't been to the gym and I feel bad about myself. And it is difficult with three children, running errands, doing all of the school drop off and pick up and all of that. And very recently, anyway, I have made peace with the fact that some days physical activity for me looks like power walking to my kids' school to pick them up. Yeah, well, what's your take on that to people who want to start? I think that's exactly it. What we know is that being sedentary is dangerous. My job, I sit all day. So I literally do kind of like 30 seconds of kind of doing like either press-ups or I do punches and kicks and I do like things like that 30 seconds. Or when I walk down to collect my patient, I do a little hop skip. So I think look for opportunities where you can exert yourself in some way. Mm -hmm. And if there's a way you can do that habitually that you enjoy, then great. Start with small habits because what we know is if you try and think, right, that's it. I'm going to go to the gym every week. You won't. It's just not realistic. So instead, think to yourself, three times a day, I'm going to get up and do five sit-ups and five press-ups or whatever, you know. Think about something that fits with your life and then build on that because anything's better than nothing. I mean, yesterday I was in my gym kit and I was like, right, I'm going to do an hour of Pilates at home today. And then my day was running away with me. I was like, I'm going to do half an hour of Pilates at home today. And I didn't. But I think okay. it's okay. I'm doing my best. To help you, ideally you want somebody else on board who's going to be a kind of accountable with you. Write it down. Even sometimes yeah. actually writing it down and then ticking it, you feel really good about it. I've done that this week. There's different ways and means, but I think start really small. Think about what might prevent you from achieving that. Maybe I'll be too tired or whatever. Okay, well, make sure you sleep well the night before. Have a look at your social media. How long are you spending on your phone? And instead do something. My twin, who's really, really into her physical exercise and her healthy eating, she said the one thing that she's found in the past that has been her barrier is getting up in the morning trying to do her run and she can't find her socks, she can't find her pants. An excuse will be there if you let it. So one of her tips is the night before she puts out all of the gear that she needs to wear to run that morning. She puts out the water bottle, the, the towel, anything that she needs for that physical exercise the next day will be out, laid out. And I, and I thought that was a, a big tip. I mean, I'm still not as enthusiastic as running at 5 a.m. every morning, which she does. <laughs> but that is a good tip for anybody who's listening, thinking that, hey, I have barriers. I think, Sophie, what you said makes sense. Think about what that barrier will be and try to work to to prevent it. So in summary, the practical advice you would give for people wanting to start physical activity is start small, start with something you enjoy, have someone to hold you accountable, think about the barriers and try to mitigate them. So that's the physical exercise. And so as far as the nutrition, if we have someone today who's listening, thinking to themselves, well, I know I've been eating unhealthy. I want to eat healthier, but I don't want to fall into the trap of a diet. What is an easy, practical advice that you can give them? Well, they should definitely watch my 10-step uh, YouTube videos. That's a good advice. <laughs> the link will be down in the description. Um, yeah, because it's all in there. But Similarly, actually, I would again say, don't try and think, right, that's it, I'm never going to eat chocolate, 
you know, I'm only going to eat healthily every day because, again, it's just not achievable. And then what you do is you feel guilty and then you think, well, and once people think they failed, they just kind of completely give up. In fact, so what might be sensible is write down, you know, like a goal for activity and a goal for nutrition each week. Keep it small, tick it off when you've done it, write what might stop you from doing it and build on it. Yeah. It's wonderful and should be a social part of our life and should be a really enjoyable part of our life. So try not to make it kind of demonized and find ways to improve your healthy living whilst staying happy. In moderation, right? Everything in moderation. Yeah, well, if you are kind of eating mindfully, then it's less likely you're going to eat three pieces of cake. Because realistically, if you're listening to your tummy, you're kind of like, okay, I think I've probably had enough. So I will take it that mindfulness is key to a healthy lifestyle. Well, on that note, I want to say a huge thank you to you, Dr. Newton, for joining us on this show and sharing your wonderful insights. And I look forward to seeing you at the next YouTube health event. Yeah, great. Thank you. And I'm going to leave the link to all of your platforms in the description so everyone can find you. Brilliant. And I look forward to listening to the rest of your podcast. Thank you. Bye. Bye. What women want to know. Personally, I agree with Dr. Newton. Nutrition and lifestyle should not be a headache. It should be enjoyable. It should be unique. It should be tailored to our current situation. For example, before I had three children, I would have considered myself a gym bunny. I was in the gym every chance that I got. And as life has gotten busier with work, with one child, two children and three children, honestly, being physically active looks a little bit different, actually a lot more different than it did a few years back. So it's all about approaching your health and lifestyle in a way that's sustainable, enjoyable, and really a reflection of the season that you are in your life. So be mindful of what you consume on social media. Be mindful of the pressures that you're faced with when you see people looking sexy or skinny. Your goal should be healthy and you should do that on your own terms. What are your thoughts on the conversation? I would love to hear from you. Please use the comment section below if you're watching on YouTube. Leave your comments because I love reading them and I love responding to them. A big thank you again to Dr. Newton for joining us. You can find all of her social media platforms in the description bar below. So make sure to follow along to learn more from her. That's our show for today. Remember, your health matters and it's okay to talk about it. Until next time, I'm Dr. Odana and this is What Women Want to Know.